have to change. Uh, we changed up a little bit as far as the sermon's concerned. Today I'll be at a Second Chronicles seven fourteen. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. Uh, and after what I observed around eight o'clock last night, I felt that this is an appropriate passage of scripture for us to go to today after I witnessed uh, a video of the attempted assassination on former President Trump. But also I got to thinking about it too. I was thinking today is 714, isn't it? July the 14th. So perhaps this is God's way speaking to his children today. Second Chronicles 7, 14, we find these words. If my people who belong to me will humbly pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. Your grace is amazing. Your grace is so powerful. I ask, Lord God, that you help us all today hear from you so that we all can leave here peacefully. We all can leave here easily. We can all here, leave here feeling better about ourselves, about our future, and about our country. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Within this chapter, we discover a lot of powerful things that we rarely hear about because we get so excited about verse 14 that many of us preachers can't help but to go there right away. But what's happening in this chapter is King Solomon has taken rulership over Israel. And he was seeking the Lord in prayer and in the temple. And it talks about how God came as a fire and spoke plainly and directly to king. And he affirmed to the king and to the children of God that through my temple, through the temple worship, you will find me. If you have issues you need to deal with, if you're going through something, you can go to my temple and find direction. But we also know in this chapter that at the time there were some things going on in the land. They were experiencing a drought and a famine. They were experiencing locusts coming and eating their crops and just aggravating people. And the Lord was letting them know that when they observe such things, they ought to get their attention. That's no different than us, right? If we observe something going on within our body, that gives us a sign that something is not right. And perhaps there's something we could do to remedy whatever pain we may be feeling in our body. So the Lord was basically saying to them, and at this time, when you see things happening to your land, you will realize that something is just not right. 
See, at the time, God used the land for the children of God to speak to them spiritually. When their land was in, during, going through a drought, or when their land was seeing a lack of, crop, uh, of crops being harvest, harvested, that was a sign to them that something was not right. And then we get to verse 14. To encourage the children of Israel that there is something you can do when you realize that God is trying to get your attention. When you realize you've gotten out of his way. When you realize all this devastation that's happened to you, there's something that you can do. And that is you can pursue me and my strength. You see, the children of Israel then had the same issue we have today. Sometimes we think we know it all, amen? Sometimes we're too smart for our own good. Sometimes we think we can solve all the problems ourselves. Well, God's telling them to, in this passage of scripture that I'm the only one that can truly remedy the problems that you are experiencing. And you can remedy these issues by pursuing me and my strength, by positioning yourselves to have ultimately the proper attitude and actions to regain God's blessings and joy. Goes on to say, if my people, the people who are called by my name, the people in whom I've given breath to, the people in whom I've created, if they would humble themselves prayerfully, if they will have an attitude to seek my face, to look into that, it's more than just coming to worship God there. It's a great example of what we see in the prodigal son story, where he was found away from the father, wasting his life, spending all his earnings and living on unrighteous living, found himself in the pig pen, thinking what the pigs were eating was, was the best that he could have at that time. But then it said he came to his senses, right? He realized that it was much better for him to be at his father's house, and he immediately went back to the father as a sign of saying, I realize I messed up, and I realize I need to be where the Father needs me to be. I need to repent of my wrongdoings so that I can find myself in a better relationship with my Father. That's the type of seeking his face we read here in this passage of Scripture. Not just reading a little scripture, not just coming to church, not just handing out something nice to somebody, but a complete dependency on the Lord. To where we're not looking to the left, not looking to the right, but looking straight towards him. That's the type of attitude we read in this passage of scripture. And that they were to repent, to turn away from the wickedness, to turn away from their mental approach, to disregard righteousness, to disregard truth and honor, to just run with every evil thought and apply it to their lives. 
sinfulness. That they were to turn away from that. I think of the New Testament, how it talks about how we should resist the devil. Run away. <laughs> Avoid sin. So that we could have peace with God. So God gave the king the message for the people who were called by their name to humble themselves and to pray and to seek his face and to turn from their wicked ways. And then, he says, I will bring healing into your lives and forgive you of your sins and restore your land. But if you read on in this chapter, you also see God presented a warning to the people. Down in verse 19, it says these words. But if any of you ever turn away from and, obey, and abandon the regulations and commandments that I have given you, and go to some other gods and worship them, then I will uproot you from my land that I have gave you. And I will reject this temple that I made holy for my name. I will make it a joke, insulted by everyone. You know, sometimes we've got to have a healthy switch, amen. Sometimes we need to be warned about sin and about our behavior. Not for us to be discouraged, but us for us to realize how important it is that we don't make God a mockery, amen? He should not be mocked. He is to be respected and revered. He is to be honored. He is to be obeyed. So sometimes we need a good warning to wake us up. Not to condemn us, for the scripture says there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, but to convict us. So that we won't fall or surrender to sin and find our way outside of God's will. The question for us lies today, church, and I think it's a question that we all can answer. And that is, is there something wrong with our country today? Yes. There is something wrong. Now, this scripture is very encouraging to us today. And it doesn't mean that if our country decided to change its attitude that God will completely restore everything. But I truly believe that if our country as a whole would have the proper attitude, we would greatly benefit from it. Because hate has just plagued this land, hasn't it? And the evilness that comes behind that. It's as if you can't have a different opinion with someone unless you hate them. You've got to hate them. That's not necessarily true. And that's not true. But if our country was to humble itself, and pray and seek God and turn from its wicked ways. I believe that will get God's attention though. What about you as an individual? Is there something wrong? 
Well, technically, we all have something wrong with us, and that's sin. In First John chapter one, verse two, and first or chapter one, chapter two, the author starts out by talking about sin and mentions to the people that you all have it. You all need to deal with it. As a matter of fact, if you say you don't have sin in your life, the author here says, you're a liar. I'm not calling you a liar today, but this is what it said. You're a liar. We all have sin. John Wesley called it a disease. We all have a disease within us that if it's not taken care of, will eventually destroy us. But the author goes on in chapter 2 and says, I'm telling you all of this not to discourage you, but let you know that when you do sin, you can take care of it. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ Christ. The righteous one. He is God's way of dealing with our sins. Not only ours, but the sins of the whole world. So if we posture ourselves as individuals to get honest with God, to be humble before him, to seek his face, totally surrender our will to him, and turn away from whatever sin that we are fooling with. He is faithful. He is just. To forgive us of our sin. And then there lies our freedom. Amen. There lies our peace. There lies our confidence. In first John chapter two in closing, it goes on to explain what the life of a person looks like who has given their sins to Jesus through confession, through repentance. This is how we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. The one who claims I know him, while not keeping the commandments, is not telling the truth. It says is a liar. And the truth is not in this person. But the love of God. Hallelujah. Is truly perfected. In whoever keeps his word. This is how we know. We are in him. The one who claims to remain in him. Ought to live in the same ways as he lived. How do you know if your relationship with Christ is real? How do you know if your faith is authentic? Is the love of God being perfected in you? Are you keeping his word. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Gracious Father, we thank you for your word. I pray, Lord God, that something was said or done 
to help the people here and those listening online. Lord God, may we all measure, measure ourselves to you, not to human beings, not to a political party, not to some human policy, but we measure ourselves to you, who is the author and finisher of our faith. And as we do that, Lord God, we ask that you honor our willingness to surrender to you so that we can go out into this land where people are fussing and fighting and provide healing to the people that is offered through your son, Jesus Christ. Lord God, may this church be a place and continue to be a place where people of all different kinds and types and whatever can come and be in unity to come and love each other, to come and uplift each other so that your light, your warmth, your mission, your purpose can not only be felt here, but lived out. Lord God, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And I pray by your grace, each person here will ask the same for themselves. Because, Lord, we all fall short of your glory. And if it hadn't been for you, being with us, saving our lives, we wouldn't be where we're at today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We'll give you an opportunity to pray right where you are. But if you just feel led to come and pray at the altar, you can do so. Just mind the Lord. stand and have our congregational response. Number 881 in the hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day he rose from the dead, presented into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. For thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.